The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Major funding for your legislators is provided by Move Minnesota, a statewide coalition fighting for a 10-year commitment to fixing our dire transportation needs. A safe, reliable transportation system strengthens Minnesota's economy. Join the conversation at movemn.org. Additional funding provided by... Flaherty and Hood has provided quality legal and legislative services to clients in greater Minnesota for more than 20 years. Our legal team focuses on municipal employment and environmental law, while our lobbyists energetically represent clients at the state capitol. Online at flaherty-hood.com. MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to the 35th session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Here is your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you are with us for an hour-long conversation about the issues that affect all of the people of the state of Minnesota. This is your program, hence the catchy name, Your Legislators, and we invite you to call in your questions or send them in to us via uh, email, Twitter, Facebook, or some any of the various electronic means that will appear on your screen, and we'll see that they get to our distinguished panel of guests. We begin each week unraveling the mysteries of St. Paul by introducing that panel to you and giving them an opportunity to tell you a little bit about themselves, where they're from, and what they do. So we begin tonight to my immediate left from District 4A, Moorhead, Representative Ben Lean. Representative Lean, you and I met tonight for the first time. I think you were with us last year. Uh, I, was, uh, I was goofing off and not here, so I'm pleased to have the opportunity to visit with you. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, what you do when you're not in the legislature, things of that sort. Sure, sure. Well, thank you for having me on. It's good to meet you here, Judge Anderson. Uh, my name is Ben Lean. I'm a, a second term state representative from Moorhead. It's uh, District 4A, so Moorhead and Oakport Township is my district. I uh, sit on the Higher Education Committee in the House, the uh, Greater Minnesota uh, Economic and Workforce Development, and the uh, Property Tax Division of the Full Tax Committee. Um, I worked for about five years, um, <clears throat> excuse me, before I was elected in 2012 with a, a nonprofit, uh, kind of a family service type organization, and specifically I worked with uh, financial counseling, so helping folks with uh, credit cards, mortgages, um, some of those types of things, in addition to uh, uh, monthly financial literacy as well. Well, we're delighted that, uh, that you're going to be with us. And, of course, the whole financial services issue has been very much in the forefront over the last several years, unfortunately. So yeah. Yeah. also joining us, frequent guest, been with us many times from District 5, Grand Rapids, Senator Tom Saxhawk. Senator Saxhawk, delighted to have us have you with us. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, well thank you, Judge. Uh, I'm from District 5, as you, as you said. Uh, that includes Bemidji, Grand Rapids, uh, Walker. Beautiful, it's a beautiful area. And... Uh, a natural resource based, so uh, most of the economy derives from uh, tourism, uh, the forest products industry, and the eastern end uh, iron mining. And uh, I'm chairman of state government and veterans and military affairs, um, and uh, I'm on the finance committee and on the K 12 and environment, natural resources, economic development uh, divisions of, of finance. First elected uh, when? 2003. All right, so working on your second decade. So I am. All right, delighted to have us have you with us. Another frequent guest, been with us many times over the years. I think our veteran legislator on the panel this evening from District 31B, Representative Tom Hackmarth. Representative Hackmarth, uh, you were with us earlier in the year, but reprise for us your uh, background for our viewers. Okay, uh, I represent uh, Northern Anoka County, Northeastern Anoka County. Uh, it's the cities of uh, East Bethel, Ham Lake. Uh, Columbus, the township of Linwood, and parts of Oak Grove and Andover. And I'm uh, beginning my 10th term. Uh, I sit on uh, the Ways and Means Committee, Taxes, the Environment Finance Committee, and I'm the chairman of the uh, Mining and Outdoor Recreation Committee. 
and uh, I'm a retired auto parts salesman. Uh, I've done a lot of other things. I've owned some small businesses. I've uh, uh, been a, uh, in a substitute instructor at Hennepin Technical Centers. Um, I'm a 32-year uh, member of the Oak Grove Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, so I've done a diverse amount of things. And all of those things are touched in one way or another by the activities that go on here at the Capitol. So we'll, we'll have a chance to talk about some of them, I suspect. Well, let's go right to our questions from viewers. We have a question via Twitter, of all things. So, and we're delighted to have a question from Twitter. Where is Twitter? What town? Never mind. Uh, this, view, this viewer wants to know, what about the Sunday liquor sales? What's going on there? What, what's likely to happen in this session? Let's start with our veteran legislator, sure. because my guess is this has been discussed once or, time, once or twice in the past. I don't, well, I'm beginning my 10th, 10th, 10th term, 19th year, and uh, I don't remember one year that it hasn't been talked about. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Sunday liquor sales and wine and grocery stores, those kind of things come up all the time. Um, no, I don't think that uh, Sunday liquor is going to happen this year. I, uh, talking to a number of different legislators, I thought there might have been a possibility when we first started, but uh, some of the new legislators that I've talked to, uh, uh, I thought maybe they were on board with that, but I don't see it happening. Um, I think uh, with some of the uh, union folks, uh, the Minnesota Teamsters, I think, are against it. Uh, the beer haulers are, uh, are not in favor of uh, Sunday liquor. Uh, and I have never been in favor of Sunday liquor, and um, uh, I think it hurts uh, 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 the, the entrepreneurs that uh, have these small uh, liquor stores, and it just uh, is an added cost. Um, they're going to have to have uh, folks on, uh, on board to uh, uh, have the store open, they have to turn the lights on, they have to turn the heat up, all of those things, and I don't think they're going to have any increased sales whatsoever. So. Uh, I think people realize if they look at the facts on Sunday liquor, it just doesn't work. So uh, I, I don't see that uh, it's going to pass this year. Well, my analysis is somewhat the same as Tom's. Uh, there's no question about it that the closer you get to a border, uh, the more support there is. It. So we'll we'll, we'll uh, talk to Ben here in a minute. But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the more rural you get, the farther away you get from the border, the less real. Uh, support there is for it, and uh, um, you know I might give some thought of uh, of supporting local choice. You know, uh, in other words, local units of government could pick what they want to do and and when they want to be open or whatever. But uh, but generally, I think I agree with Tom that it, it's probably not one of the priority issues for this session. <clears throat> Representative Lee, you have one of those border towns. What do you think? I do. I do. I uh, am one of, as some of my colleagues remind me, one of the uh, 20 or so that <laughs> did vote for it in the last session. Um, <clears throat> and when I uh, hear from constituents on this matter, you know, folks do tell me they would like that opportunity to go, um, you know, go pick up uh, liquor and alcohol on Sundays. And so, um, you know, it's something I'm in favor of. And I kind of see it, too, as not so much a... Uh, competition issue being on the border with uh, North Dakota, but kind of an opportunity or rather a lost opportunity issue that um, if those businesses, you know, those liquor stores could be open, they would be open, you know, but for the loss. So that's that's something that, uh, you know, I like uh, my colleagues say, you know, I don't know there's a lot of support for it enough to push it over the edge this session, but uh, it's always a popular issue, though. Well, the, the popular issue of the day, at least in the questions that are before me here tonight, is transportation. And it comes in a variety of ways. We have a viewer here who's <coughs> concerned about uh, overweight trucks and uh, factories that put overweight trucks on the road and wonders if we shouldn't be doing something about that. Uh, people are for and against uh, ta increases in gas tax. Uh, and others are noting specific roads that are of, an issue, uh, uh, of issue, uh, specifically Highway 60 in Wabasha County. We're going to wrap all that together, and we're going to talk about transportation. Let's start with you, Senator Saxog. Uh, what do you think that? Where do you think this is going this session? Well, I, I think that uh, that what we're really talking about here is is how we're going to raise the money. Uh, first of all, I guess I, I should say that none of us, I don't think, really believe that Minnesota's roads are in terrific shape. And in fact, I think we'll be fall, uh, falling behind more and more all the time. So the question is, how do you finance uh, the improving the roads so that we can bring ourselves into a competitive situation, particularly in rural Minnesota? I think we have a, we have a problem. 
um, it, with that infrastructure and delivering our our goods to market and, and uh, the whole thing. So uh, the governor's proposed uh, the equivalent, and we can do it a lot of different ways, of about 20 cents a gallon on, if you put it right on the gas tax. And uh, and so that being that, that being the case, uh, he, uh, he uh, yesterday laid out his plan for 600 road projects, and, and uh, those of us that or could easily go in and find out if you're in Itasca or Cass or Beltrami County where where you're going to see your your roads be improved and uh, and it was impressive and I've been on most of those roads that were mentioned and most of them indeed need some real some real work so I think uh, it is important that the public uh, go out and look at the roads, look at the potential that we have if we do want to invest that much money in our system and see what might be improved. And then kind of work your way either up or down uh, and, and talk about if, if, we, uh, if we split the difference, uh, if the governor and, and uh, the House bill uh, uh, if we split the difference, uh, what would we end up with? Would we end up with 300 uh, projects, or, or what would it be? But I do believe that it is, even though we haven't heard uh, that much, uh, barring yesterday, on this particular subject, I do believe that it will be the beginning and the end of the session, and uh, it will probably be the last major issue dealt with in the session in the middle of May, and when it's over, and and uh, and if we do come to a conclusion on it, that will be the end of the session. Representative Hackbarth, your thoughts? Well, well, I agree. Uh, this is going to. I think before the session even started, everyone knew that it was going to be the transportation issue is what's going to get us out of the session. Um, either either we're going to have a end of a session, or we're going to have a shutdown, or we're going to have something. But that's going to be the deciding factor in May, and when we leave. What did we do in uh, transportation? Um, I don't think that you're going to see a gas tax increase from the House, and I'm sure the Senate's going to want to do a gas tax increase and carry the governor's uh, a proposal to increase the gas tax or a sales tax on gas, and I just don't see the House going along with that. So that's going to be the deciding factor uh, uh, at the end of the session. So uh, uh, I, I do disagree with Senator Saxhog a little bit. The governor. Uh, puts this transportation plan out there about these 600 projects. Now, the amount of money that we're going to increase the gas tax or bring this money in from the sales tax, is that going to pay for all of those 600 projects, uh, Senator Saxhawk? I don't think so. I don't know that he can pay for those 600 projects with just that ta uh, gas tax increase. I don't think that's going to happen. Not unless you're talking maybe 50 years from now, it'll, that eventually they'll uh, catch up with those 600 projects. But that's not going to happen. That's not what that was all about. He says, here's these 600 projects. We need more money to address these 600 projects. But that's not going to pay for all 600 projects, not in the next couple of years anyway. Well, it's, so, no, this is a 10-year plan. Yeah, right. It is. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of transportation dollars already in the system. Uh, the, they're being diverted to other projects. They're being diverted to uh, light rail and commuter rail and subsidizing those things. All you have to do is go and stand out here on University Avenue and look at the green line going by and count how many people are in each one of those five or six cars that are going by every few minutes. Practically none. And how many people are actually paying to ride that train? I mean, we're totally subsidizing all of these light rail projects that cost billions of dollars to build in the first place. Each one of these lines is like a billion dollars to build, and then the ongoing expenses. And that's all being subsidized by gas tax already. I mean, that's where our transportation dollars are going. We could have great roads in the state right now with the money that we're already bringing in. We do not need to increase the gas tax, and we don't need to put a sales tax on gasoline. Um, we put that sales tax on gasoline, and, and there's that in automatic inflator in there. This is going to be ongoing and costing more and more money all the time. All it takes is for the gas price to go, the wholesale gas price to go up, to increase the uh, sales tax on the gasoline. I mean, this is nuts. This is crazy, and the people in Minnesota should be very upset about it. I mean. Uh, the governor lays out this plan, and this is the uh, it's, it's 
the governor's plan is my way or no highway. And that's really what this is going to be all about. Uh, our plan or no plan. So uh, that's what the end of session is going to be about. All these other things are pretty much insignificant this year. Uh, there are a lot of issues that we do have to address, but it's really going to come down to transportation. Representative Lee? I, I agree. I think we all knew going into this session that this was going to be the transportation session. The uh, group of uh, different stakeholders moved Minnesota. I know they were going around the state before session. Well, really, I want to say 2013, these folks were going around the state, too, talking about the needs. And, you know, I don't think anybody can argue that the needs are out there. We have about $1 billion, uh, $1 billion just on the uh, state highways, $1 billion in infrastructure maintenance needs right now. You go out 10 years from now, and we're talking about $6 billion total. Um, you know, talking with different uh, business groups and things for, um, you know, commerce not being able to uh, move along our state highways. We're talking about an annual loss of revenue for businesses, about $243. And so I think, you know, we have to take a look at doing something big and doing something long term and doing something comprehensive, including, um, you know, for our state highways, for local, high, local roads and bridges. Um, also talking about different uh, uh, forms of infrastructure at airports, talking about different ports along Duluth, uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis. So, you know, I think this does have to be very comprehensive. And if you take a look at the projects that were out there, or I should say the projects that the governor released on that list just this week, 74% of those projects are in greater Minnesota. So, you know, taking a look at different revenue sources, and this is a conversation I know that we're all going to be having over the next three, four months or so, um, but if you take a look at the different sources of funding between the general fund cash, the bonding, um, trunk highway funding, gas tax, um, Greater Minnesota is going to get more dollars coming out of the trunk highway bonds or coming out of those um, gas tax funds that are dedicated to the trunk highways. So. You know, I think we have to take all of these into, uh, into consideration and really look at this as a very long-term, comprehensive package that um, I think folks on both sides of the aisle, uh, folks in both chambers know that we have to, uh, have to address. Well, I, you know, uh, Representative Hagbark got pretty revved up here. Uh, well, and, and I was talking about uh, who is going to be upset. and. Uh, you know, I, I read the part of Minnesota that I represent, uh, I, whether I'm talking about my county commissions or my uh, the people I just talked to or the city councils, they're going to be upset if we don't do something about our transportation system. And as far as as far as the light rail, you may or may not like it, but it wasn't billions. Representative Senator Saxhawk, it's a billion dollars for each one of the lines. So yeah. it's a billion dollars for each line. So you're line. talking about now we've got the line coming from Minneapolis to the airport. Okay. There's a billion. Okay. The green line is a billion. Okay. It's a billion to put one out to Eden Prairie. Well, you just it's going that, to be a billion is that there? Is that, is that has that been proposed. built? Is that yeah. well, you, you bet proposed. it's been proposed? Yes. Each one of them but is a billion dollars. You're right. That's what I said. You just said billions. Bill, we've got two billion. More than one. Right. Not. Is that we've what it means? More than one. We've got two. All right. We've got two. Each one is a billion dollars to build. We'll get that resolved. Uh, viewer from Crystal wants to talk about anything else on transportation. Don't want to get in the way of anything else that we need to talk about there. No. All right, we'll move on. Viewer from Crystal wants to know about the medical marijuana bill. Doesn't like the bill from last year. This viewer says Minnesotans need real relief from chronic pain. Why don't we just legalize marijuana? Marijuana going to be an issue this session? No. No. No, no, I, no. no. It, was, it was a bad bill that passed. It just built a lot of bureaucracy, and it's not going to do much. We, uh, we talked earlier. We do have, I, however, we do have some western states, Colorado and Washington, who, who got themselves involved in selling marijuana, not just medical marijuana. And uh, I think we'll take a long, hard look at them before we would ever do anything on anything. We have a, a viewer who wants to talk about the invasive species angle. Uh, Representative Hark Hackbarth, we'll start with you because uh, you had uh, we discussed this a couple of weeks ago. This viewer's takes on this a little different, and why? This viewer wants to know why the state can't penalize those responsible for bringing in invasive species, companies and countries coming into the ports on Lake Superior. 
Um, that's an interesting angle, but invasive species more generally, what's going to happen this session? We'll start with you. Well, and, and, the, and the viewer is correct that uh, a lot of these, uh, uh, like the, um, um, the zebra mussels came in uh, through, through the Port of Duluth, most likely uh, in, in ships, and that's where that came from, and it spread that way. And, uh, and, and the viewer is right. Uh, we should be uh, penalizing people that get caught with these things, and, and that's true. But I think what the viewer is really talking about, and I think what the general public is concerned about, is uh, the law that passed in 2012, which is the uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Sticker and Education Program that was passed in 2012. And I think a lot of people are upset about uh, uh, needing to take this course mm -hmm. online. There's a number of different issues with it. Uh, I believe it's a $5 fee to uh, uh, take the education course, and then they mail you a sticker to put on your trailer. Uh, some of the problems with that is if you live in Iowa, for example, and you're going to go fish in Canada, um, you have to have this course and have this sticker on your trailer as you move through the state of Minnesota. Uh, I think that's wrong because the people in Iowa really don't even know that uh, Minnesotans need to have this sticker on their trailer. Uh, another issue is uh, not everyone's going to have to take the course. I own a boat. I own a trailer but uh, I've got three kids that might want to use my boat and trailer. They don't have to take the course. They don't get the education course, and they don't have to get a sticker or pay for it. Uh, there's really no consequences to them. Um, so they don't get the understanding that they're the education where they're supposed to uh, look for uh, zebra mussels, uh, look for uh, Eurasian water milfoil <coughs> on the boat. They, it doesn't benefit them in any way. There's a number of different issues that are wrong with this whole program. Uh, the DNR didn't think it out well enough. Um, the uh, $5 fee, I think everybody thinks that that's another fee that's going to go to the DNR. That $5 fee does not go to the DNR at all. It goes to the vendor that they hired to put the education program together, and then you go online, you take the course, you pay the $5, the vendor gets all the money. And the people think that, you know, I'm tired of paying the DNR all this money. Well, the DNR doesn't get any of that money. It goes directly to the vendor, and it's ongoing. The vendor puts a package together, and he gets paid forever. Every time that uh, anybody buys a trailer and they have to take that course, he gets $5. The DNR gets nothing. So uh, this uh, vendor is going to become a millionaire from that, and uh, there's all kinds of problems. This first developed in 2013, or no, I'm sorry, 2011. Uh, and the DNR put a, a similar package together where they had a sticker that you had to put on your boat. And uh, there was a number of problems with that. And the DNR came in in 2012 and said, oh, we got to get rid of that uh, sticker program. This is the new sticker program. This is the one that will work. So we repealed the 2011 law. We put the 2012 law in place. And we don't make that effective until July of 2015 in order to work out the bugs. Well, here we are, almost July of 2015, and we didn't work out the bugs. And now we're finding out all the bugs that it has. And it's a real problem. Uh, there's some question as to whether the DNR had the uh, authority to uh, let this vendor collect the $5 from residents. Um, there's a lot of people that aren't, don't have computers. Uh, there's a lot of places where uh, people don't have broadband or cable or uh, any way to be on the Internet in the first place that own trailers. Uh, there's a lot of different problems with this uh, uh, law that was passed, and uh, we need to repeal it, and it should be gotten rid of and come up with some other idea. Now, I also want to let folks know that they're already paying $5 when they buy their boat license for aquatic invasive species, and that goes into a special account to address the very issues that we're talking about. So they're already getting $5. That's going to the DNR. They do education programs with that. They put up signs at boat accesses, etc. They put uh, information in your uh, uh, hunting and fishing regulations. All of those things are in place. Can we do more? Probably, yes. But we're already getting that money from the boat licenses, and uh, we should just get rid of this law, and I think that's what the people want to see. Senator Sachs, on invasive species. Yeah. Uh, first of all, in answer to the question that was asked originally, uh, we really whack somebody who has, is caught with AI, AIS. I mean, mm -hmm. if you find a zebra mussel in your live well, you know, you're up for $500 fine. This, we aren't fooling around with that. Mm -hmm. This is about education. And the education, uh, the, the, uh, the 2011 bill is passed is an education bill. I think it's, I think it's 
been reasonable and that it has been has uh, has dealt uh, with education but there's a bill in the Senate right now in fact I'm the author that uh, does a couple of things and addresses a number of the things that Tom's talking about first of all the the person going from Iowa to Canada uh, assuming he doesn't uh, back his boat into a lake he just buys bait and eats and stuff like that will never be checked and uh, it, the it can, the, uh, the checking for the decal can only be done at the landing. Um, the decals are free, and we won't, and they won't go into effect until 117. There will, if if you don't have a decal, which you need to go online, and and uh, then a free decal will be sent to you. Uh, it is a $21 civil penalty. So, so that that bill will be working its uh, way and and over to the house and. We're assuming that we can come to some conclusion on that. Otherwise, we'll be back at the 211 bill. Representative Lean, your thoughts on invasive species? <clears throat> well, I don't uh, sit on any committees that have jurisdiction over natural resources, invasive species, but I certainly understand the, uh, you know, the, the importance of this issue. I mean, in my opinion, it's not just about, I don't know, the uh, pristineness of our lakes and waterways and... Uh, you know, for that matter, other sorts of invasive species. But it's also about economic development, you know, making sure that our lakes stay clean so that a lot of these uh, resorts and um, I know Ballard's up, uh, up on Rainy River, you know, ma making sure that folks yeah. want to go to these resorts still. You know, you talk around Aiken, Crow Wing County, a lot of the resorts. And so I think it's really, uh, you know, about the education. And I think, too, we need to be working with our local partners on this matter, whether that be the counties, whether that be the lake associations. I've sat down with uh, a couple lake associations in uh, my part of the state. They're, you know, a little further east, Detroit Lakes, but, um, you know, talking, they have the willingness. They want to be doing some of these things. They want to be seeing the, contamin the decontamination sites at the public access sites, you know. And uh, we did fund, I believe it was $10 million uh, per year in the, in the uh, 2014 tax bill um, to kind of give the counties that have, some, that have a lot of lakes, have these uh, waterways, a uh, little more resources to be able to combat the uh, aquatic invasive species. So, you know, it's something that we absolutely do need to be, be uh, very diligent about. And, you know, I guess I would just like to see those continued efforts working more with the local partners. Viewer from Anoka wants to, wants to talk about uh, an issue we've not actually had a chance to visit about uh, in the six or eight weeks we've been at this here this session. This viewer wants to know about whether or not there's going to be anything happening with moving the primary to June, and this viewer also is raising a concern about the national popular vote and whether that will pass this year. Uh, so we, A, first of all, need to answer that question about moving the primary to June, and B, explain the national popular vote to people and whether or not it's going to pass. We start with you, Representative Lean. I, uh, <laughs> I, I uh, personally don't support moving the, uh, the primary to June. I think that uh, that really, I don't know, kind of crowds the system. I mean, it kind of spaces the primary out from the general a little more. But, you know, you're talking uh, incumbents who are going to be here through third week of May, you know, to be able to run a primary campaign between then and second week of June or so, you know, I, I think, especially for greater Minnesota legislators, I think that's really kind of puts folks at a disadvantage. Um, as far as the national popular vote, you know, that's something I haven't supported in the past. Um, and this, I assume, is the requirement, the state would pass a law uh, mandating that the electors vote for whoever receives the most popular vote. It, it essentially bypasses the electoral college right. arrangement. Right. And I, I guess I don't, I wouldn't want to see that go because I wouldn't want to see the folks that Minnesota prefer, you know, the presidential candidate Minnesotans prefer, get the get those electoral votes based on what the rest of the country does. So those are, I guess those are my thoughts on those two issues. Senators, Senator Saxon? Well, maybe I'm a traditionalist, but, uh, you know, I, I still haven't seen any real reason to move around the, uh, the primary. You know, I mean, I, I know I've listened to both sides of the issue, but still kill this, can't see the overwhelming reason to change it. <laughs> and, and as far as the uh, uh, as far as the popular vote, again, there are there are good arguments. But again, I, I haven't seen that our argument has totally failed or 
field. I, I, I think it's, I think it's done the job for us, and and so I, I'd think twice before I'd vote for any type of change. Yeah, I, I think we all agree on that. Uh, I, I, I do believe it's going to be an issue. I think uh, we will see a bill on this in the House. Yeah. Maybe the House will pass it. Probably won't pass the Senate, and uh, it's not going to become law this year, at least in my opinion. I do not support uh, either one of those issues either. As a matter of fact, I didn't even like it when they moved the primary away from September. I really preferred <coughs> it at that time. Uh, but you're actually absolutely right, uh, 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 Representative Lean. Uh, um, moving that primary up is going to be difficult, particularly for incumbents. Uh, we're going to be paying attention to campaigning when we should be paying attention to uh, uh, legislating. Right. So we have, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to do credit to this viewer's question, and so if I mangle it, uh, the wonders of electronic communication, send it in again and we'll ask it the right way. But this, this actually goes to you, Senator Saxhog. This is a viewer who wants to know, is raising a transportation question with respect to the Esser Steel issue and is concerned about uh, interchanges and reconstruction projects uh, driven apparently by that project and wondering about uh, whether any of those are going to get funded. Can you help me with that? Uh, give me a little background on that. Well, the Iron Range Expressway was originally to go from uh, Grand Rapids to uh, the Virginia Ellith Quad City area and, and, uh, and didn't quite make it. Uh, it has made it all the way over to West, uh, almost a scenic highway of uh, just uh, east of Bovee. But there's a, an area in there which will be directly south of Esser that is not four lane yet, and mm -hmm. and I think that the the viewers probably wondering when the Iron Range Expressway will get completed. Um, well, I, I, it won't be completed unless we come up with a transportation package that's that's major. But uh, there there are transport there's some other transportation issues. Uh, uh, going on on the range right now, and, and it revolves around uh, rail transportation more than it does uh, road transportation. And uh, that that being the case, uh, I think you saw this year when the the oil started being um, uh, trained out of uh, railed out of uh, North Dakota, uh, it it put a lot of other commodities kind of on the sidelines, whether it was grain, paper, taconite. All of them were uh, because, and I guess if I was running a railroad or I'd be doing the same thing, uh, they got priority in, in running the, uh, the railroad. So I think what we're thinking about on the Iron Range is, is uh, emphasizing, and, and there's room in there for a, a second railroad, um, uh, the, uh, the Canadian National, um, doing some work to uh, bring some uh, some uh, different spurs into different places as Minnesota Power and some of those places to keep our our energy costs down as low as we can and uh, I hope that it, I hope that kind of answered the question but but we're really thinking about transportation because it's a huge issue when you have the commodities that we do in northern Minnesota and North Dakota Anything else on that? We'll move on. Uh, we have a viewer who has a question about estate taxes. This uh, the viewer says uh, uh, their owners are trying to save a three-generation farm, but the Minnesota state tax is high, and uh, they're wondering if there's some possibility of making it the same as the federal tax. Um, uh, anybody want to talk about estate tax issues? I'm just not that familiar about... Uh, okay. so, Senator Saxog, <laughs> I look at you. I, I do know that uh, there are a lot of people that uh, uh, have large farms in, in southwestern Minnesota, et cetera, that uh, are facing that issue, and we really should address it. Yeah, I, uh, I do hear about that issue. Um, you know, state taxes right now, the exemption is $2 million in Minnesota. Yeah. The federal is $5 million, yeah. And I have signed on to legislation to bump up that, ex uh, that exemption for Minnesota. But uh, the viewer touched on, I think, uh, another really good point, which is, uh, you know, some of the issues that farmers are facing with property taxes right now and actually uh, you actually have that question as well so that's a great okay, okay, great answer sure, go right sure. ahead <clears throat> uh, representative mark Wart and senator eakin and i uh just this last weekend sat down with a group of farmers in clay county talking about property taxes egg property taxes you know you have the increase in crop prices and then you know a couple of years later your van land values are going to come up and then crop prices drop and your land value you know that takes that couple of years lag for the uh, land values to come back down and so you know I think we really need to uh, 
you know, really put on our thinking caps, I guess you could say, and take a look at this from some different angles, you know, for the short term, short term, are there things we can do with different sorts of refunds and credits for the agricultural homesteads, you know, maybe even extending it to the agricultural non-homestead? Um, are there ways we can uh, uh, base the property taxes on, you know, crop prices or the revenue that farmers are generating? you know, and somehow backfill what might not come in the uh, lean years, you know, to the local governments so that we're not having shifts put on the, the homeowners, the commercial industrial property taxes. So, you know, there are a lot of questions there that uh, we need to address. And, you know, these issues, they come in cycles, kind of the boom and bust cycles that are, um, that is the agricultural market. But, and so this really is not a, a new issue by any means, but you know it's it's not going to go away either in that respect too. So I think it's uh, really important that we take a look at what's going on now and come up with some comprehensive way that we can really address this for the for the long term. Well, property taxes are the way the local units of government raise uh, the taxes for uh, their local roads and schools and whatever, and so. Um, uh, uh, you know, I how how you probably certainly Ben, you know how to deal with that a lot better than I do. Uh, as far as the state taxes and uh, uh, as as you've both have talked about, you know that's that's one of those things where the family farm I think is important. I mean, I don't I don't I don't want anybody to have to sell a farm if they really want to be on the farm. And uh, heaven knows we have enough corporate farms as it as it is, and so uh, you know I'm. Anything we can do, I think you hit on it. We got to make that exemption higher. We've got to get it closer to the federal exemption. Anything else? All right. Viewer from Wilmer wants what the, wants to have the panel tell us something about the governor's proposal for a 50-foot land buffer around wetlands. Uh, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I believe it's uh, one rod now on each side of a, a drainage ditch. Sixteen and a half feet, right? Yep. Something like yep. that. Yep. Yes. Sixteen and a half feet. Something. And. Uh, so, uh, and the governor made a statement at uh, the Minnesota Roundtable a few weeks ago uh, that he believes that it sh we should extend that out to 50 feet on each side of uh, uh, ditches, uh, rivers, streams, lakes, etc. And uh, that's, I, I think it's uh, pretty crazy to do something like that. I know that there's a lot of folks that want to do it, uh, uh, environmental folks and uh, uh, maybe some hunting groups and things like that. But uh, there was a deal made a couple of years ago to make it the um, one rod on each side of drainage ditches, and I think this kind of uh, destroys that deal that was made. Um, so uh, uh, I think this, I see this more as a uh, taking, uh, more of a uh, property rights issue, and I think that there's a lot of farmers that are very, very upset about this. And uh, uh, I don't see a proposal coming forward. I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, of course, we don't see any of the governor's bills yet. It's getting pretty late. Uh, we're getting up against uh, our first deadlines here pretty soon. And uh, still, the legislature has not seen one bill from the administration or any of the departments yet. And I think that's pretty sad. But uh, so there might be something in some of his proposals somewhere, uh, but uh, I have not seen any individual bills coming forward to say that we're going to uh, move this to 50 feet on each side of uh, waterways. Senator? Well, I think what this brings forth is the enforcement issue. Uh, you know, I agree with with uh, Representative Hackbarth. Sixteen and a half feet is probably adequate, except that's not what happens, uh, and uh, and it's it's because we don't have a good enforcement system. Uh, you know, if you if you put it on the local units of government, they're they're constantly trying to enforce this on their neighbors. I mean, I'm, we're all in, in, involved in local government sooner or later. If you want to go to um, uh, and what we probably should be then doing is is uh, going to to uh, air photos or whatever, but the fact is 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 uh, as with everything else, about ninety percent, five percent of the farmers are doing what they're supposed to be doing and putting the sixteen and a half foot buffer out there, and the, and the, and the five percent that are ruining it for all the rest uh, take a foot every year, and pretty soon they're practically in the river. You know, it's. And so uh, I, I do think it's an enforcement issue more than it is uh, raising it from 16 to 50. Representative Lee? You know, I, I don't have a lot to add to, to this issue. Um, I think uh, uh, Representative Hackbarth and Senator Saxog summed it up pretty well. 
Um, you know, I guess I would just listen to both sides of the argument, you know, the DNR, the environmental folks, the farmers and the landowners, and, um, you know, try to strike that balance as we need to do really with any issue. Uh, if I could just add, um, Senator Saxog, you're absolutely right. It is a uh, uh, an enforcement issue, but when I first heard about this at the, at the DNR roundtable, uh, what I said is, yeah, it is an enforcement issue, but who's going to pay for it? I mean, who's going to pay for that enforcement? Who's going to go out and, and measure to make sure that it's 50 feet? Uh, how are you going to uh, regulate this thing? Who's going to pay for it? That's what I want to know. How are you going to pay to regulate it? Uh, are you going to uh, pay farmers to keep it 50 feet back from each side of a ditch? So that's 100 feet. I mean, think of the amount of uh, crops that you're going to lose. Uh, some, in my area, we have a lot of sod farms, and the, the farms aren't that large, but they do have drainage ditches running right through the middle of their farms, and to give up 100 feet on each side of a drainage ditch is insane. I mean, that just gives... 50 feet on each side for a total of 100 feet. A total of 100 feet. I'm sorry, did I say it wrong? But you, you doubled it. Oh, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> 50 feet on each side is 100 feet, and that's that's horrible. I mean, that gives up a lot of acreage. Now, is the government going to reimburse these folks? I don't think so. That's not what they're going to do. They're just going to make it a law, and then we're going to have to regulate it. I mean, it's costing money uh, everywhere you look at that. It's just foolishness. Foolish. Well, well non-point source pollution is with us. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm no ultra environmentalist, but there's very little question. You look at the Minnesota River and its tributaries, the non-point source pollution is there. Uh, you know, we produce uh, egg products second to none in the state of Minnesota. The things we do to raise it uh, um, cause pollution, you've got to have a buffer. The buffer is the simple, natural way to do it. It's not shut down the farms. Mm -hmm. And so... As I say, I think I, I think it's enforcement. I think one of our problems is is that we've we've put it on the local units of government, and and uh, and it's I haven't ever had to go talk to a farmer, uh, and because I don't live in that part of the country, but for local units of government to go enforce on one of their own is not an easy thing, I'm sure. But we do have we do have the sixteen or the one rod on each side. We now. do have one rod, yep. and if it's enforced, I yep. think it's probably adequate. Excellent. Viewer from Lake Elmo wants to talk about an issue that has been very much in the news the last couple of days. This viewer heard about the proposed state constitutional amendment on data privacy issues. Viewer thinks it's a terrific idea. What does the panel think about it? Um, so let's talk about that proposed constitutional amendment. Who wants to take a run at that? It's not in any of my committees. I haven't seen the language. I'm not sure exactly what it's all about, but it sounds like a good idea to me. Who's it? Oh, go ahead. It's a constitutional oh, I think what's happening, it's a proposed constitutional amendment uh, dealing with uh, electronic data issues and would provide additional, the argument is it would provide additional protection by becoming part of the Minnesota Constitution, or the search and seizure provisions of the Minnesota Constitution. And for our viewers who may not be aware of this, uh, we have a federal uh, uh, search and seizure protection which is found in the Fourth Amendment. We have a parallel provision in the Minnesota Constitution. Minnesota legislature obviously can't ch make changes to the federal constitution, but can provide additional rights in the state constitution. And so that's where I, this is my interpretation of the discussion. I could be completely wrong, but that's what I pick up from reading the newspapers. Okay. Representative Lee? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, you know, just on the surface of it, I think this is really addressing new technology that's, that's coming yeah. about. You hear from law enforcement with the body cams, the uh, license plate readers, and, you know, there's online market, you know, you go online and you search a couple websites and, you know, group, you know, marketing folks can collect your IP and sell it. And so, so I think this is really getting to the heart of just new technology that's out there and really putting laws around that new technology to make certain that, um, you know, we are safe from, from intrusive searches and seizures. So, so I think it's it's absolutely a conversation we need to be having um, how it how it advances in the legislature this this session. You know, I'm not certain at this point, of course, but something we all need to be uh, thinking about and um, you know educating ourselves about more and having the conversation. And constitutional amendments probably won't come up until next year anyway. Yeah. Right. Because but, they, well, but, they, but that in itself is an issue. Right. And I think I I don't disagree that, that this could go on as a. To, and on the ballot is a constitutional amendment, 
But I'm one of those people that think that any anything that goes on a constitutional ballot ought to uh, at least have a supermajority in the legislature before it goes on. So that's that's the issue that that I would bring up on this whole thing. So a viewer from Farmington wants to know about there's a, been proposal to, proposals to lower the drinking age most recently to the age of 18. What does the panel think about that, and is there likely to be any action in this session? Representative Lee, let's start with you. No. I, you must I, be the closest. You're the closest right, to 18 right, right, yeah, yeah, on the yeah, table, so we're picking yeah, on you. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't see that going anywhere. I personally wouldn't support that. I think, uh, I mean, People's brains don't really fully develop until we're 24, 25, so, you know, I'm not going to by any means argue upping the drinking age, but I certainly don't think we should be going the other way. You know, people have, quite frankly, people have too much growing to do, I think, too much maturing to do at 18 to, you know, be getting into uh, really drinking and some of the uh, possibly negative incidences and decisions people can make, so... I think that uh, Representative Kahn's argument was that 18-year-olds, uh, if, if asked to sit down and have a beer in a um, legal setting of a, of a bar or a, a mini brewery or whatever we have nowadays, thinks he will act in a more mature way ultimately. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that, so I probably, I wouldn't be in support of that either. Yeah, I don't see the bill going anywhere this year at all. I don't think it has the support. Uh, Representative Kahn put some of these bills in get attention sometimes. So um, we have a viewer who wants to talk about K-12 or pre-K-12 or whatever we're calling it this year. What's going to happen with uh, uh, what we what I used to call elementary and secondary education in terms of financing? Who, so well, viewers, we, right? we, we always increase funding for education. I don't think that's <laughs> ever been in the legislature in my uh, last uh, nine terms that uh, we haven't increased education funding. Uh, it's our top priority. I think it's everyone's top priority to uh, increase uh, education funding uh, as long as it's going in the right way and being spent the proper way. Uh, K-12 education or uh, pre-K pre uh, to uh, 12 education will get additional funding, probably will be on the formula. Senator Saxhog? Well, I think uh, I think Senator Hackbarth is right, and, and I think the um, um, the big, uh, I won't say, uh, the big discussion will be whether you should put more money in the different ways that we're thinking about doing it for early ed, which, which is a way of of, um, of reducing the amount of uh, number of students that are in special ed, I believe, and I think it's been it's been proven, or are we going to put more on the on the formula, which is basically feeding special ed, which right now is is just killing school districts. You know, like not only does it cost a lot of money, but you can't find any special ed teachers. And so um, I, too, agree that uh, there will be a significant amount of uh, funding going to, to uh, education, and it probably will uh, be uh, at the hest of, of the local school district. We'll send the money out per student and say, use it as you need to. Representative Lee? Yeah, I uh, certainly am a strong supporter of the uh, early childhood. You know, the all-day kindergarten we put in place last session, I think that was great. Um, <clears throat> going even beyond that to the, uh, uh, the the hot lunches for every student, you know, I think that's great. I think um, now that we're having the all-day kindergarten, um, you know, going the route of uh, school breakfast for students, you know, I, I think that's all great. And really, when you break it down, it's it's really about investments. If we were to be funding um, early childhood for every student in Minnesota, you know, that's roughly two three percent increase on our annual state GDP every year and so that's you know two three percent might not sound huge but that's five to seven billion dollars a year on top of our state GDP so um, you know I I think it's uh, ultimately an investment and ultimately an investment that's going to help grow the state you know help grow the state's workforce and in the long run help grow the state's right. economy I, I think one of the other things particularly in rural Minnesota because uh, the large metropolitan schools have been able to do this, but having some way of the local school districts uh, funding facilities uh, will be important too. Our, uh, the, the rural facilities are really uh, very difficult to uh, um, to finance because of the uh, difficulty in doing the uh, referendums. 
And so if, if, uh, if, this, if the state could fund uh, even a couple hundred dollars a student, um, and, uh, and that wouldn't have to go through a local referendum, um, just to do roofs and sidewalks, I, th I think that w that's got some real legs, too. You know, I want to go back to this uh, uh, early childhood piece because we had some discussion, I think maybe our first or second week of this program, that the, that the break point or flash point or line of tension was maybe um, about programs for uh, specifically school districts that uh, have, um, you know, high student need versus statewide because of the cost. Um, several hundred million dollars, I think, was one of the figures that was thrown out to do it statewide. So have, is that where the discussion has been on, on early childhood education? Who wants to take a run at that? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I certainly support different ideas that we can fund early childhood, different ways we can get kids into these programs, you know, at that uh, pre-K age. And Personally, I would say putting it on the districts, putting it on the formula would ultimately be um, the most equitable way to do this. You know, I've heard a lot of pushback on the scholarships and things that, you know, it's going to the most needy students, but there are also, or I should say, the, the most needy families, but there are also those families who, you know, they're, they're not, they're not getting, I, I guess you could say, their fair shake of it in the sense that, um, you know, putting it on the formula like that is going to open it up to all families ultimately. So, you know, I, I think we do have to be taking a look at this in different ways and everything, but ultimately opening up these programs to as many families as possible is, you know, the end result I, I would think we would all want to achieve. The achievement gap is, is very real in Minnesota. We're towards the bottom in the country. Um, we're, we're towards the top when it comes uh, to the education of the white uh, populace, but as far as our minorities go, we're towards the bottom in, in the gap between them and, and the uh, white population. This is, this is one way to, um, to get the, um, the, the population that's falling behind to be able to read by the third grade, which seems to be the earmark that we, that we go to. And so uh, that, that's kind of the argument for the scholarship. And, and, and what, what it always gets down to is, you know, the, the lower middle class, middle class, you know, where's that line where, so where, where sure. the people right above that, you know, they're having problems making it too, and they aren't going to get funded, you know. And, and so then you get back to the, to, the, um, to the formula, because at least that's, you know, that's fair for everybody. So. But, but part of the discussion is also going to be about uh, equity funding. And uh, I think uh, from the, at least the House perspective, uh, with the leadership that's there now and Sandra Erickson's committee uh, looking at some of these policy issues, um, the, the equity funding issue where you're spending many, many, many more dollars in the uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis districts and getting a worse result for the amount of dollars that you're spending, something has to change there. And I think uh, uh, Representative Sondra Erickson is going to be looking at that and hopefully coming up with some solutions. Something's got to change there because we're spending more money and getting a lower uh, bang for our buck in the uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul school districts than, than ever before. We've got a couple of viewers, one in Shockby, one in southwestern Minnesota, who were reacting, I think, to some of the discussion earlier about uh, moving, moving oil via trains. And the viewers say, why not build pipelines? And uh, there has been some discussion, of course, about the natural gas pipeline in northern Minnesota, and uh, there have been other pipeline proposals. Is there any legislation that touches on these pipeline issues that's being proposed? You know, I don't think there's any right now, but uh, I've talked to a few folks. There might be some coming forward, and uh, hopefully we can uh, make that happen. I think uh, just about everybody would like to see uh, those pipelines uh, develop. I think pipelines are the safest. I think uh, there's the least amount of... Uh, especially with new modern technology, the least amount of chance for uh, pollution. And, uh, and I think right now it's, it's in the hands of, uh, um, MP, it must be in the hands of the MPCA, and I think it's going through the process. And frankly, I don't think that uh, it, once it goes through that process that there's going to be anything from stopping the additional pipelines that are need, needed to go through Minnesota and, and, and all that oil that, that is right now. And that's light crude. You know, that, that stuff hits the, 
as you know, it's going through more. Mm -hmm. If you know that stuff hits the road and it blows, I mean, it's yeah. it's it's explosive stuff. So and, we and, need to be doing that. And even with the new pipelines that uh, are proposed and talked about, uh, you're still going to have the train trains pulling uh, oh, uh, crude as well. Ho I mean, it, you, you need it all to make it, it all work. It, hopefully, though. We'll be able to use the trains uh, for grain and and iron and paper and all those other commodities also because yeah. it's it's not happening. Representative Lean, you, you're pretty close to it. Yeah, you're closer to yeah, anybody else. Yeah, uh, story of the last five years right. or more. You got about, really. <laughs> you got about a minute, so tell sure. us what you well, think. I try to sum it up in a minute, but uh, ultimately, you know, I, I think pipelines have to be a part of the conversation. Um, but we need to make sure that it's done right. We need yeah. to make sure because, as you say, it is the safest, but something were to happen you know it's it's a catastrophe yeah. so we need to make sure it's done right um, it will take some of the pressure off the rail traffic and that'll be certainly good for communities like Moorhead and Wilmer and Staples um, but it's not going to completely alleviate alleviate the uh, the rail traffic so you know doing more what I've been really wanting to talk about with this being the transportation issue is more rail infrastructure as well around the state all right that's going to be our concluding word I want to thank our panel for a terrific program thank you the viewers for your participation we hope we answered the questions and invite you to return next week and all the weeks that follow until the legislature goes home here on your legislators thank you and good night There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all of our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join us in the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching your legislators. Major funding for your legislators is provided by Move Minnesota, a statewide coalition fighting for a 10-year commitment to fixing our dire transportation needs. A safe, reliable transportation system strengthens Minnesota's economy. Join the conversation at movemn.org. Additional funding provided by Flaherty and Hood has provided quality legal and legislative services to clients in greater Minnesota for more than 20 years. Our legal team focuses on municipal employment and environmental law, while our lobbyists energetically represent clients at the state capitol. Online at flaherty-hood.com. MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans.